Hello and welcome to College and Mental Health, Challenges and Resources. This is the first in our Beyond the Headlines series. I'm your host, Vivian Lee. Heading off to college is a milestone in anyone's life. But with a third pandemic academic year upon us, the mental health of college students and the need to connect them to those who can help are more important than ever. According to a survey taken by Best Colleges, 46% of students rated their mental health as fair or poor, compared to 22% who rated it very good or good. The biggest stressors on mental health were academic pressure, current events, and financial difficulties. Here at the City University of New York, recent statistics from Healthy CUNY showed that 20% of surveyed students have some type of anxiety disorder, while 18% suffer from depression. Nearly 9 out of 10 students have not visited a campus mental health center. And with these disturbing numbers in mind, we're here today to bring you expert advice on maintaining your mental health, including resources and a first-hand account of how the struggle is real. We will talk about how the pandemic has exacerbated these struggles and point to resources that students and their parents or significant others can use in order to help overcome mental health obstacles. With me now are three people who are on the front lines of helping schools and students manage their mental health. Laura Roberts is Associate Professor in Counselor Education at Lehman College. She prepares graduate students to become school counselors. She is also a licensed psychologist and maintains a counseling practice and works with high school and college students. Victor Schwartz is the Senior Associate Dean for Wellness and Student Life at the CUNY School of Medicine. He has advised multiple colleges across the country for more than three decades and is the CEO and founder of Mind Strategies. Finally, Kennard Lewis, a graduate of Lehman College who personally struggled with his mental health while completing his studies. CUNY's mental health resources not only helped him to complete his BA, he was inspired enough by his own progress to work toward obtaining his mental health license. Welcome to you all, and thank you very much for your time. I want to start off with pre- and mid-pandemic issues. So pre-pandemic, we knew that mental health among college students was a serious concern. Mid-pandemic, the term self-care becomes a real buzzword for those who are suffering with mental health and those who are not. And now, hopefully mostly with the pandemic behind us in the rear view mirror, we understand that the pandemic affected everyone very differently and especially those who were struggling with their mental health. So I wanna start with you, Laura and Victor. Can you talk about what were the challenges before the pandemic and how did COVID change those challenges, if at all? Okay, I think that, you know, so we know from some of the data that you just presented too, from some of these studies that there have been ongoing issues that the mental health of college students has been on decline for the past two decades. And so I think that what happened was, you know, with anything, whenever, you know, we, we, most of us have a set point of a, our, our, our overall well-being. And then when a crisis event such as a pandemic would happen, um, obviously that, that would have a, a dire impact on our mental health. Um, and so, so I think that what I have seen, and, and again, I think that a lot of it boils down to, um, you know, feeling really destabilized by these events. And so when, you, when, you know, things are not stable in your life, it's, it's hard to, um, to navigate and, and having, you know, feeling anxious, um, not knowing where to go or how to access resources that can, um, make it even worse. Clinically, did you notice, um, certain commonalities that were happening? among students when they came to you for help in your practice? Yeah, in my, yes, in the practice I did. A lot of them felt very isolated socially. Um, they didn't, they felt like they were missing out on, you know, experiences that they should have been experiencing. They looked forward to being in college, being independent, you know, having, these, you know, great social networks. And it was very hard to navigate um, when they're behind a screen. There was grief, the yes. in other words. Yes, quite a bit of grief, degree. yeah, and disappointment. Victor, can you talk about what college administrations come to you for? And is it 
any better now, now that we have this greater empathy and awareness and acknowledgement of how important mental health is, or is it worse? Well, the good news is there's more awareness of the problem. I mean, there's, there's much more awareness of the need for colleges and universities to be providing these kinds of support services and to be providing them in a, in a kind of holistic way, looking out for students who might be struggling, trying to identify and really provide support as quickly as possible, as we were talking about before that college counseling has been a, a kind of testing area for a good socialized medicine where we're valuing preventive care, we're valuing education around you know self-care and things like that. The flip side of this is the problem has gotten worse nationally because resources in communities have eroded. Funding for these kinds of services are a challenge in, in a lot of places. And students are under stress because society feels unsteady and unpredictable. So I think 30 years ago, those of us who went to college felt we'd have a really kind of predictable shot at having a you know, reasonable career trajectory through our lives. We'd find something and have some kind of stable, predictable middle class life. It, that no longer feels like a certainty for young people. So you actually thought there would be an infrastructure already kind of forming and you're finding that, no, you're still building it? There's been an infrastructure building at colleges over the last 25 years. So colleges have been building their counseling services, their uh, mental health education efforts, their drug and alcohol education efforts, their student affairs efforts over the last 25 years. The challenge is that for students who need more than what the schools are able to afford to provide, it's very, very hard to find more services out in communities. So for young people with severe mental illness, we're often really, really in, in a tough place to find them the care and support that they need. And they'll need that usually through their whole career. And with this special, we're actually trying to reach all of those students who may be at varying stages of realizing that they need help, which makes me turn to you, Kennard. Congratulations on getting your school counselor license, first of all. Thank you. That's a huge that. accomplishment. You are now working towards getting your mental health license, which is a, a graduate level. Yes, it is, yes. Um, you finished your studies mid-pandemic? Yeah, I graduated with my master's last year. Okay, and then so I also continued getting my license during the pandemic as well, like right after that. So as soon as I graduated in May, there was a four month break and then I started school up again in October. So you, in our conversations before, you mentioned how elementary school and high school issues yes. uh, were issues that you didn't deal with, being bullied. Yes. Um, yes having suicidal ideation, yes. and you brought that into college, which is already a really challenging phase. Yeah. At what point did you decide that you needed to seek professional help? Uh, it took me a while. Like I think for a long time I was coasting, you know, with my one good friend, um, just getting through it, you know, finding my confidence, using my videos, using radio as a way to you know, use my story as a way to help out others. Because even though I love to speak and I, you know, I love radio, it actually was therapeutic for me. Like even I was providing stories, but I was also getting a lot of stuff off my chest. But I wasn't into my senior year of undergrad where the radio and my, my TKW videos, they weren't cutting it. And I kind of needed that professional help. Sorry, what was TKW? Uh, th that was my, uh, my movement called The Canard Way, Spreading Joy and Happiness. <laughs> preaching the phrase, do you, do you think it's right? So that was just a way, you know, me realizing that joy and happiness can go a long way and preaching that phrase, do you, because when I was bullied, I was contemplating whether it was a good idea being myself because I was bullied for it, stuttering, socially awkward, overweight, there's like wearing glasses, like there's so many things that for me, I felt like was wrong. And I felt like being myself wasn't good enough. So I had to unlearn those toxic behaviors or those toxic thoughts and kind of redefine myself a little bit. You told me earlier that there was somebody uh, really important in your life, yeah. a friend who stood up for you, yeah. that was really inspiring for you. Yeah. But what do you say to any students out there who are in the middle of the stress of struggling and if they don't have that kind of support around them, yeah. how do you convince them to even start thinking about finding mental health treatment 
and help? It's a hard one. I, I, I think it starts with understanding that it's okay to need help. I think that's one thing that I struggle with a lot. As a man, as a man of color, as a black man, it's like getting help means that you're weak because it's like you got to do it by yourself. You got to survive. But I think starting with that, it's okay to need help and finding trusted adults. I feel like I didn't always have that growing up. That's why it's kind of interesting as me, as, as an adult now, that I'm that trusted person, but I'm not seeing the people, or I didn't see the, somebody like myself when I was a kid. So I think finding those trusted adults, but if there's not, find, find avenues where you could be yourself, find little niches and little groups and clubs that can bring out that inner you that's beautiful. Uh, I think that's where it starts. And then trying to find out you know, within your major or within your teachers, somebody who's willing to listen, but that could be hard because not everybody is willing to listen. But I think taking that leap of faith and knowing that I'm not sharing to gain pity. I'm not you know, self-disclosing so that you can feel sorry for me. I'm doing this because I need to. So I think that's what we have to get tired of, tired of being at the rock bottom or tired of being where, 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 where in this place where we don't feel comfortable. So I think we got to get tired of that and then leap. It, that leads me to ask, because I had gone through a search for a therapist myself, and I remember yeah. wanting to find a particular person, someone who yeah. mirrored me to some degree and mm -hmm. who would be empathetic. Yeah. Did you find that was a problem? Like in the, it, among therapists and counselors that you interviewed to try and find the right one, were you yeah. looking for someone of color, for example? Were you looking for someone male? Yeah, um, I've been in PWIs, which is predominantly white institutes, for middle school, high school, and undergrad. So that's 11 years of my education, maybe like 11 out of 15 uh, or, or 20, of me being around people that don't look like me. So my school counselors were not black. My therapists in the schools, the social workers were in black. It wasn't until, again, senior year of undergrad where we finally got a black therapist. So it took 11 years almost, like the end of my PWI experience, I finally got one. And luckily when I went to Lehman, you know, I got help with Dr. Chen Hayes. He put me in front of my, my uh, therapist that I was seeing for a year and a half and that was helpful because I was worried, I'm, I'm leaving a school to go to another, I can't keep those same services because I'm not a student there. And that's what's also troubling about finding somebody that you trust in, in the school, is that you leave, those services are cut off. So now you have to find somebody else, now you gotta use insurance, what if you don't have that? You know, what if you can't afford that particular therapist because your insurance is not covered by them? So, it's, it's, so that was hard, but I think, um, I'm like I'm still searching now. I think finding that finding black and brown therapists within the within the city has been difficult too. We wanted to find out if CUNY students are checking in with themselves and getting the help they need. So we hit Baruch College to find out what causes their stress and what they're doing about it. Being at, at a student in a CUNY school like Baruch in a pandemic was was a lot for me because uh, I was not familiar with the the structure of the school, where certain places were at, or who to call for help, and as well as just being a student in the city. I've been going to like the mental health um, clinic that they have. You know, they have like uh, therapy sessions that you could schedule whenever you feel like it, and they're really helpful. You could just talk your problems out, and I feel like it relieves a lot of stress. You have to get used to like a new experience. College is like completely different, you have to learn how to take exams differently from high school and stuff like that. But you get used to it and you learn how to adapt. Yeah, I did the counseling sessions last semester. Like, I was a little bit late when I did it, so I went into like um, after the semester ended. Um, it was really helpful. Um, it gave me like new like tricks and activities to do to kind of like ease my mind and like um, just center myself and figure out like one of my issues is like sometimes um, well all the time um, I don't know how to connect my like words with my emotions like I don't know how to express how I feel so that was one like one thing that we talked about a lot in the counseling session 
Laura, can you talk about some exciting new news that you're you're bringing to us on along these lines? The yes. fact that CUNY is 75% black and brown mm -hmm. says something about the need that may exist among those students who are looking for mental health counseling but yes. can't find enough um, of a therapist pool to choose from. So yes. what's being done right now that might help that? Well, during the pandemic, halfway through the pandemic, we decided we would work on a proposal to create a 60 credit master's degree program in clinical mental health counseling. Um, and so we just found out three weeks ago or so that it was finally approved by New York State. And so this is very exciting news for <laughs> us. Starts so, giving like a little fist you know, bump. It's interesting. We, we I couldn't had, wait. I had to go. You know <laughs> what I mean? I had to go right into well, it. Well, you know, we, we've had, we have a lot of people reach out to us. A lot of students have, we've had a lot of interest. Even when we did, you know, as part of the process, we had to survey students to find out, is there interest? And we had an overwhelm, overwhelming response. I think it was something like 78 to 80 percent said they would be interested in, in um, enrolling in a, cl a clinical mental health. Why health is program. that so significant for Lehman College? Is it just because of where it's located? Well, first of all, we're the, uh, they're the in, in the Bronx, there are only two other clinical mental health counseling degrees offered um, at private universities. And so we're the only public university. We're the first one in the Bronx to actually offer this program. It's full time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be, um, and you can finish an over two year period. And so we're we are delighted that it's actually been approved. Congratulations. Thank it you. It wasn't an easy feat. <laughs> no, it was not. Collaborative effort, but we got it done. So we're happy. Congratulations. Thank you. Victor, maybe you can talk about overall the, the bigger picture because there's a, a federal agency, the Health and Resource Service Administration, that predicts an appalling shortage of clinicians, therapists, and school counselors before the year 2025. I mean, what does this say about who's in the pipeline and how we are able to get more people in there? Well, I mean, this is a great effort because we desperately need to be training more young people to go into these fields. There are, I think, about 20% of the children in the United States live in a county where there's no child and adolescent psychiatrist. Right. So imagine that, you, you need to travel, and in, in many cases, I think the Times did a series about the tremendously long waits for children and adolescents to get to see a therapist. Uh, and we, the only way to address this is to really make these kinds of efforts, to train more people, to make them more appealing. Um, you know, the insurance coverage is very, very inconsistent for these kinds of professions. So we really have a national crisis in having enough clinicians to provide mental health care, and particularly for communities of color, the problems are even more acute and more extreme. We, you know, we need, we need more young people like Kennard to be pursuing these kinds of degrees and these kinds of careers, and, and you know, we need to do things strategically to make them appealing to young people. So let's talk now about the resources that are available here at CUNY. Um, I, I looked through the Healthy CUNY Surviving and Thriving at CUNY guide. Mm -hmm. It's like a 90-page tome, but there's a huge chunk of it, about 30 pages that are devoted to understanding mental health and understanding how not treating it leads to mental illness, uh, the different kinds of counselors that you should be looking for. There are different... Like, categories of professionals that people should be mindful of when they're looking for someone. Why is it so important to have, for example, a counseling center located at all of the campuses at CUNY? I mean, there are, what, 25 centers that people can call. There's an address, there's an email. But why do we want to make that possible for, for students to easily access? Anyone want to well, take a there's a need, there's a huge need for it. And so, you know, we have it on all of our syllabi. We make sure that students are aware that, you know, these are services that are available to you. Um, and I know at Lehman we offer individual, group, um, presentations, there's, and they address all issues. And they're even offering it virtually as well. And that's really important. Virtually? Yeah. yeah. As in they have like set days and hours when you can just tune in and find somebody? Well, I think what it is that you can, you can actually, you, there's a process of getting there, but that's okay. something, they, they're trying to make it more as, as accessible as possible to all students because it's, they know it's a need. 
And is this the kind of thing that administrations generally are trying to do across the country? Yeah, I think anything that expands the availability of resources, that makes it easier to get into care, that makes it more efficient so that counselors can see more students more, more efficiently and more nimbly uh, is definitely a positive step. If there's one small positive that came out of COVID, we recognize that you can do a fairly decent job doing counseling and therapy over virtual platforms. It's not ideal, it's more challenging with, with new clients or patients, but if you can get more people in with you know, 80% of the effectiveness, then you've accomplished something. You've expanded your capacity significantly. Now, treatment isn't one size fits all. So after going through a, a counseling center, perhaps somebody doesn't find the person that's right, can you suggest any other resources that students can turn to, any, any websites or anything at all that they could start educating themselves with? Well, there are, you know, NAMI, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, has excellent resources out there. The CDC and the NIMH have a lot of information. Groups like the Jed Foundation, where I worked for a number of years, have a bunch of mental health resources. But people need to be careful about some of the for-profit virtual uh, therapy resources out there. Uh, you need to really do careful investigation before you sign up for those. The quality varies dramatically. And the incentives, again, to, you know, to, to get people to use them in different ways are very uh, variable. So, you know, there, there are resources out there, but it's important to do your research and make sure you know what you're using uh, and be careful with that. Kennard, you had mentioned that it took you some time. Yeah, um, I think I think just going on the uh, the accessibility, I think it it gets discouraging, where when you have to travel lengths amounts of time to get to your therapist. I think it, it it's, it's kind of very, very very similar to kind of like food deserts, but this is like a mental this is a counting desert almost, where you don't really see that many people willing to get those services. So like me, luckily I was in the Bronx and I was able to travel to Lehman. But if, I, if I'm coming from Brooklyn and I have to go to the Bronx to, to get those services, it kind of sucks. Because, you know, it, it takes a lot to not only self-disclose, but for some people it takes a lot to get out of bed or even to show up for themselves when they felt defeated, you know, their whole life. So I think having it close to home just makes the battle like you know more winnable or at least like easier to actually fight but it's worth it it is it is i think i think having a space to to talk and to unload and to unpack i think it's always worth it because at the end of the day something that was weighing on you is now gone and that doesn't happen overnight but you chip at it away day by day and you feel cleansed you you feel free you don't feel chained to the beds, you know, the shackles of depression or anxiety. Mind you, these are everyday battles for many people. But when you have someone to talk to, now you're not alone. And we shouldn't be because we're we're an interactive species. We shouldn't be battling our, our demons by ourselves. I think college is so difficult to begin with. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. already really challenging. And NAMI, the institute that you mentioned, they put out a statistic not that old, like within the last decade or so, that found an appalling number of students don't even finish their, their studies. They don't finish college, they don't finish university because of the mental health challenges. Like a good proportion of them um, have not sought the help. Um, Laura, what would you say to someone who's considering going into mental health treatment about how big the need is and how much those students are needed? to complete those studies, but also to, to help those um, outside who are considering not doing so. Right, so to, you mean to the to actual students who are experiencing yes. these things? I would say it is critical. It's critical for yourself, but also for society that, um, you know, I often say to when people say, oh, I, I, I'm too busy, I can't do this, I've got too much going on. You know, it's kind of like when you're on the airlines and they, they come down, they always say, they, they, they come with the oxygen mask, I always say, they say, take care of yourself first and your child. If you really want to be successful and you want to be good for others, whatever you choose to do, whatever um, profession you choose to, or career you want to 
you want to pursue, it's important that you take care of your, your mental health. It's, it's critical. You know, sometimes students feel very, again, the, they think about this dreaded process of finding a therapist, just as Kanara described. You know, one way, I, I think this is something that's underutilized, but just even reaching out to your professor and just saying, this is what I'm experiencing. I think, I will say from Lehman College at least, like, I think the professors are pretty understanding and they're, they're willing to be flexible and also, you know, but sometimes when you have that connect, connection with someone else that you trust, um, that right there can be helpful. I was reading a study um, earlier today. It was about, talked about how in some campuses they're actually even training their custodial staff to be. Really? Yeah, I don't know if you read that about. That's actually yeah, pretty cool. You know, so they can actually. And maybe, is this because of the contact that they have with students? They're just, yeah. they're seeing them all the time. They're on a first name basis. Yep. Kind of, wow. And they're teaching them to sort of be aware of like what to look out if a person seems isolated. And then just ways to make connections. Now that's not necessarily mental health, but it's just sort of just connections and self can be more you know, preventative. I As opposed to staying closed mouthed yeah. about it and not wanting to share what's going on. Mm -hmm. Custodial staff are sometimes the first people to know that a student has an eating disorder <gasps> in a residential college, right? So they may be, there are people within the system who are, you know, we talk about as natural gatekeepers because they're people who might have interactions with students that might give them clues yeah. that a student is having a difficult time. These are like freshman English professors, so students who might be writing about their experiences. Uh, you know, athletic trainers are often, for students who are involved in, in you know, serious athletic pursuits, often hear about the struggles that students are having. People in the bursar's office, the financial aid office, often hear about the life challenges that students are having. So you want to make sure that those people know that there are support resources available and as you said, know where to send a student if there's a concern and know how to have that conversation with them yeah. about going to the counseling service. Yeah, it's very disarming when you could just talk and not feel like you're being judged and in those cases, a teacher or a custodial staff they're regular, they're regular people, they're just, just, just like counselors, but now you're in a space of comfortability. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what's so great about having it, ex like accessibility with, with uh, counseling services because it's in my home, it's in my environment, it's somewhere where I actually know. I'm not traveling to, to some unknown area. I'm not speaking to some unknown character. This is somebody that I could trust and be around and be able to just be vulnerable. And I think that's a beautiful, ex like a beautiful experience. So. Thank you to all of our guests today. And for more information, please visit healthycuny.org. There you will find the guide called Surviving and Thriving at CUNY, which lists the mental health resources available on CUNY campuses for those in need. For CUNY TV, I'm Vivian Lee. Thanks for watching.